the more open you are to opportunities, the more likely things will happen to you. When you've been stuck in the same role or the same industry for a long time, you tend to sort of be very comfortable. So you say no to lots of things. And actually, the best things happen when you say yes. Welcome to Career Relaunch, the podcast focused on helping you overcome the challenges of making a major career change. My name is Joseph Liu, and I'm here to help you figure out the steps you can take to move on in your career and make your professional ambitions a reality. In each episode, we'll be speaking with people who have an inspiring career story to share, learning from the brave leaps they took to pursue something new and helping you find the clarity, confidence, and courage to make your own brave decisions that improve your career and life. You can subscribe to this podcast by going to careerrelaunch.net, where you can listen to all the latest episodes and get more useful resources to help you navigate your own career journey. Today, my guest is going to talk about relaunching her career from being an agency account director to becoming a set designer. We'll talk about the importance of meeting all sorts of people and saying yes. Afterwards, during today's mental fuel segment, I'll wrap up with a few thoughts on being open to opportunities, even when they're not completely perfect. On today's show, I'm speaking with Polly Aspinall. Having spent seven and a half years working in an agency as a creative director and account director for brands such as Johnny Walker, the BBC, ASOS, Smirnoff, and H&M, she recently made the leap to become a set designer for TV and film, window dressings, photo shoots, and interior design. She spoke with me from her home in London, England. Hey, Polly, I know you've had a really busy few weeks filming until midnight on most days. So thanks so much for making time to join us here on Career Relaunch. No problem. Happy to be here. Can you start off by just telling us a little bit more about the work you do as a set designer? Yeah, of course. So I have just started off in the world of set design, and I'm currently working on a TV show. And basically what I do day to day is kind of anything from um, going out and buying props. I can be given the kind of color scheme and the design of a room, and then I have to go off and find the perfect vase, for example, that will fit, or the tea towel that uh, one of the actors would use in their kitchen. Other times I can be kind of making things. So just this week I made a hundred fake hamsters uh, for a scene that is coming up. A hundred fake hamsters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Hang on a quite- second. So how do you, how does one go about making a fake hamster? <laughs> Well, um, so obviously they had to look like they were moving and they have to look sort of kind of semi-realistic, even though they'll only been seen for sort of 10 seconds on camera. I needed to make 10 hamsters that would move and kind of 90 that would just kind of sit and look like hamsters. So I bought a whole <laughs> load of cat toys <laughs> uh-huh. and then I bought some plastic eggs and some fake fur and basically covered 100 plastic eggs in fake fur and then attached some to cat toys that they move. And they are surprisingly, surprisingly realistic, actually. Wow. Are there guides to making fake animals or do you have to improvise and come up with this yourself? No. And actually, that's a, that's a really good point about the job. I would say that the, the main thing about the job is that it's all about problem solving. So you will be given a problem like we need 100 hamsters and we need them in a week. And you have to work out what the quickest, cheapest and kind of most realistic way of of creating things is. It it comes down to things like making fake wine and find a liquid that looks most like wine that obviously won't mean that the actors are drinking alcohol whilst they're acting. So, yeah, there's all kinds of things like that where you really have to use your brain to kind of creatively problem solve, which, which I absolutely love. What's the strangest thing you've been asked to do as a set designer? A few weeks ago, I had to make uh, fake um, ashes, (laughs) as in human ashes. So there's a scene where, sadly, one of the character's fathers has died, and uh, they are presented with the bag of ashes to sprinkle somewhere. But they throw them up in the air, and then they kind of blow back into the actor's face. So you have to use something that is safe to breathe in. It has to be something that's not too kind of disgusting or gritty that might hurt the actor. So there's a particular um, type of earth that the theatre industry used to use to make ashes, um, and it's now been proven to be carcinogenic. So I, again, had to kind of go off and problem solve about how to do this. Um, And I ended up dyeing a whole load of baby powder, talcum powder, and I dyed it sort of grey, and then you have to let it dry, and I had to measure out exactly the amount that a human man makes and yeah, so now now we have we are the proud owners of two and a half kilograms of fake human ashes. Wow. <laughs> Very interesting and stuff that I have never really 
thought about. And I feel like we could spend this whole time just talking about all the different stuff that you make. And set designs is very interesting, but we are definitely here to talk about your career. So let, let's definitely come back to the set design because I'd love to hear a little bit more about your current projects at the end. But when you and I first crossed paths, you were doing very different work. Yeah. At the time, you were working as a creative producer and account director at a marketing and advertising agency in London. Can yeah. you just take us back to what you were doing before you got involved in set design? I um, used to work at a lovely little agency. It was a kind of integrated agency where we did a bit of everything from strategy to events to publishing. We even um, kind of created and developed a few mobile phone apps. I'd actually been there for seven years and I had, being such a small company, I'd kind of done a bit of everything. So I, I dealt with clients on a daily basis. I wrote strategies. I came up with the ideas for campaigns um, and then I actually produced them. So it was a background that kind of taught me to do a lot of different things and to be very um, kind of chameleon-like and to sort of become an expert in something very quickly. But it was very much focused on the world of kind of marketing and advertising. And our main clients were alcohol brands. So I spent a lot of time kind of talking about nightlife and cocktails and things, which was really, really interesting. But I sort of, I got to a point where maybe it was kind of starting to not challenge me as much. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you started to realize that you weren't being challenged and you weren't growing or that you were stagnating? So I did architecture at university. When I left university, I was sort of searching around for what I wanted to do. And I found this amazing agency. And I kind of never looked back because it just took me on this whirlwind. And I learned so much and I loved the people. And I found out that I was quite good at what I was doing, um, which was kind of intoxicating. But I think I sort of looked up after probably about four or five years and thought, this is great. But actually, if I had sat down and thought, what do I really want to do? Would this be it? And I think I kind of started thinking back to my more creative, more design roots and more about creating spaces and, and places. And I really started to kind of hanker after, uh, after that. I sort of realized that the world of marketing and advertising, although I loved it, it probably wasn't my first love, as it were, was. I think I really felt this need to try something different. And you mentioned something that, that being good at it was sort of intoxicating. So obviously you were good at your role. Can you take us through what it was like to walk away from something that you knew you were pretty good at, but maybe wasn't something that your heart was in? So it was about this time last year that I handed in my notice, but it took me a good six months to kind of come to the conclusion that, that I should. And I have to say, it's pretty terrifying because walking away from a place you love, the people you love, a lot of my friends in different industries complain about their jobs a lot and are day to day quite unhappy in their work. And I had never once been unhappy in my old job. I was very lucky. So compared to most people, a lot of my friends sort of said, why are you doing this? You already have the perfect job. And, you know, it, it was sort of the perfect job. And also, uh, not to mention walking away from being paid quite well into a kind of unknown abyss of, um, <laughs> of being very junior again. Yeah, it was really scary. Telling my boss, who had been my mentor as well, was also somewhat terrifying. Do you remember the moment when you finalized your decision that now is the time to go? I found a course at Central St. Martin's, which was actually in set design, and it was a week-long course, and it didn't cost a huge amount. So I took a week's holiday and did the course, and I said to myself, by the end of this week, I will know if I really love this and if I should do it, or if I, you know, if actually I hate it and it's going to be a whole load of sort of drudgery to get there. And I did the course and absolutely loved it. So on the Friday night, I just thought, yeah, Monday morning, I'm going to do it. It was a pretty emotional weekend, actually. I mean, I sound like such a baby, but I spent the whole weekend kind of on and off crying. It was like going through a breakup. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. What do you think was making it so emotional? I think because my old agency is such a sort of small team and I've been with them for such a long time. It was like a family. Because the world of set design is entirely freelance, it's not like I was leaving to go to a permanent job. You leave to basically put yourself out there. It was also probably quite terrifying. Okay, so you make the decision, you resign. What were the next few weeks like for you? Can you just take us through your new life and how you started to build your new life as an independent freelance set designer? So when I, when I handed in my notice, I had a three-month notice period. But then after that, 
basically because of staffing and kind of capacity issues at work they actually asked me if I could stay for another couple of months until Christmas and kind of go down to two or three days a week on which the sort of other days I could do kind of set design work and actually that was sort of the perfect launch pad for me because it gave me kind of half a week to go off and meet people do work experience so I, I basically started by making this huge list of people I knew people I knew who knew other people. I stalked a lot of people. <laughs> uh-huh. I would watch TV shows, find out TV shows that I loved, find out who the designer was, and then basically send them an email and kind of say, hi, I'm now free. And I did a lot of free work experience for people. So I basically said yes to everything. So I worked on theater things. I went in to watch a TV show being filmed for kind of a couple of weeks. So I I basically, by Christmas, I got a whole load of experience and a whole load of meetings with various people under my belt, which sort of set me up really nicely for the moment that I kind of, moment that I sort of left work permanently. So yeah, that's what I was doing, making lots of contacts. (laughs) <laughs> what do you think was the toughest part of recreating your life as a set designer? As a freelancer, you are you are continually looking for the next job. And therefore, it really relies on you being very, very proactive and also very good at networking. And networking was never, ever something I ever prided myself on. Um, I think I'm naturally quite shy. I do find putting myself out there and meeting new people quite terrifying. And obviously at the beginning, it was all that, you know, I I didn't know any of these people and I had to sort of just put myself out there. And I think as well, combined with that, there's the, there's the sort of moments when you, you write a really well crafted email or you call someone or you have a coffee with someone and then you never hear back from them again. And, you know, you chase them a few times. And I've realized now that that happens, you have to send 20 emails to get one response. Coming from a world where I spoke to clients all the time and clients have to call you back. (laughs) That was probably one of the toughest parts. The rejection combined with constant, relentless networking on your own behalf. I think when a lot of people talk about networking, they're thinking about going to an event with a name tag uh, that says, hi, my name is, with a wine glass in one hand and you're shaking hands with the other, which can be really, really terrifying for people. Uh, How did you get through that period? Because it sounds like you don't love networking and yet at the same time you were doing it. What kept you going? For every few rejections, I would get a real breakthrough. One memorable breakthrough was I went to go and see an incredible exhibition at the V&A. And I came out and I just thought the design was wonderful. So I wrote to that. Well, I researched the, the guy that had designed it. And he had, he's won awards for films. And he was this complete hero and sort of idol of a man. And I wrote to his agent and I actually met up for him, with him for coffee. And I'm now in quite regular email contact with him. If I was going to aspire to be anyone and, you know, realistically never get there, he would be the person. So I think victories like that really kept me going through the kind of rejections, I guess. (laughs) Is there anything in particular that you've learned about networking that you think would be valuable for someone to hear if they are struggling with trying to figure out how to get started with networking? Meet up with everyone that you can in the sense of sometimes a friend would say to me, oh, you should meet this person. And at the time I'd think, are they really relevant? They're in theater or they have nothing to do with the world of set design or But actually, I think everyone you meet has an interesting story. You never know what connection they might make. And also, it's just it's just quite interesting to meet all different types of people. So I think meeting up with everyone that you have the opportunity to is really, really great. And the other one is always say thank you. When people kind of give you their time, whether it's an email or a coffee, I'm always very, very careful to kind of obviously thank them lots of the time, but also to always follow up and say thank you. A, because it's obviously a great way to get back in contact, but B, because I just really am very very, very grateful. And one day, if I sort of do get somewhere in this industry, I will very much do the same for other other people kind of starting out in the industry. And I think it's quite important to kind of keep that circle going. One of the questions, or I guess one of the, the skepticisms I get from people who are trying to change careers is this idea of having to deal with starting over. When you were approaching these people and describing the fact that you wanted to get into set design, even though you hadn't really done it professionally before, what was the reception like amongst those people? Actually, one thing that I continue to get, <laughs> even now, now working on the TV show I'm working on now, is people saying, why are you leaving the well-paid world of advertising for TV? 
I mean, people can't believe it because I think a lot of people go the other way. So, you know, they work in TV for sort of 10 years and then they move into to advertising. So there's a lot of people kind of saying that some sort of more kind of mentor type figures in set design saying, well, it's really great you want to do this, but are you sure? Are you sure you don't want to stick around, stick with what you're doing? But people have been generally quite receptive. I think what people find quite hard with me is that because I've worked for, you know, seven and a half years and I'd got to a relatively senior position, I think people find it really hard because technically I should be in a really junior role, but they feel, I don't know if they feel guilty or they feel like they're not using me properly if they put me in that because they can't, they can't give me a senior role because I don't have the experience. So I've actually had to really battle and say, I am very, very happy to be junior, I promise. I suppose what people might worry about is that I might be very arrogant about it or get angry about the fact that I was so junior. But actually, I, you know, I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> I see. It's quite nice to not have the responsibility for a little while. So has there been anything else that's been really surprising about going from a more experienced role to a more junior or what I'm going to call an entry level role? So I think anyone changing industry at my sort of age would find is that a lot of the people in charge of me tend to be younger. At first, I found that not difficult, but kind of it made me realize how late I'd I'd come in the game to this. I'm kind of totally fine with that. I have some friends who I don't think would be. I mean, I'm very happy to be told what to do. I also, you know, I also like to be in charge as well. Don't get me wrong. But actually, age and experience are two quite different things. Age doesn't necessarily mean experience and vice versa. But it was a bit of a mental leap at first. The other thing I'm curious about is what it was like to go from working in predominantly an office setting into what I'm going to guess is a much more hands-on job. What was that like to make that sort of a transition? TV shoots tend to be, let's say, eight weeks long. You just get settled and then you're moving on to the next thing. So yeah, not only is it not in an office, but you're working with a team who are only your team for a couple of months. It makes it quite exciting. At times, it makes it quite stressful because, for example, we've been filming on location this week in a in a house, a very, very um, huge, beautiful house. And obviously, when we're at the studios, there are dedicated offices that I can spend time in and you know do my research or whatever it is I'm doing. But on location, you sort of just have to find anywhere you can and just set up there, which can be quite strange. But I always find the first day is a bit a bit disturbing and you don't really know where you are. But by the sort of second or third day, you're really settled and you're actually quite sad to leave that place. Your life is never stagnant. And it does mean that the days and weeks go in a good way. They go a bit slower because I did find that working in the same job for such a long time, I would look up and a whole year would have gone past. Whereas actually the last two months have gone very, very slowly, but in a very good way, because I've just learned so much and seen so much and heard and met so many people. It sort of puts a necessary um, sort of jolt of electricity into your life, which is great. Do people understand that you weren't doing this for your entire career, that this is something new for you? Or does that even come up at all? People assume because I'm doing such a junior role that I'm quite young. They might realize it's my first or second job, but they think that's because I'm in my early 20s, which I is great. <laughs> <That's a benefit. laughs> right. Yeah. But a lot of people are quite surprised when I tell them that I've had a whole other career. A lot of them say, wow, why are you doing this? It's not something that many people do. It's definitely not something where people go, oh, yeah, I know other people who've done that. So far, I'm the only person I've met who's ever done this route. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're certainly the first person I've met who's uh, made this sort of change, which makes it very unique. The other question that I get from people sometimes when they're thinking about making a change is they have this fear of losing all the skills and experience that they had built up before they made the change. Have you found that your experiences as a creative producer or an account director, has that shown up or has that helped you in any way in your current role as a set designer? There's a lot of like, Uh, sort of intangible things like obviously dealing with clients a lot and then also um, kind of managing teams to get things produced in my previous job. In what I'm doing at the moment, I am constantly talking to people and persuading people to do things. So I had to call um, a pizza restaurant uh, yesterday and try and persuade them to open two hours early to make pizzas for us on a shoot on Monday. And I feel like the skills that I've learned through my sort of previous career really kind of helped me to be able to have those kind of conversations. And I think if I was coming fresh out of university, I'd be very scared to have those conversations. And I also just wouldn't know how to do it. 
And then I also think the kind of creative thinking that I used to have to do has really helped with this kind of problem solving aspect of things. So whenever I'm not doing set design work, I am freelancing back in the world of marketing just because it's, you know, it's a it's a world I know and it's a, an easy way to pick up two, three weeks work at a time. And actually what I found when I go back, I write a lot of presentations when I'm in the world of marketing and I'm so out of the the kind of habit of it now I've kind of have to sort of, it takes me a few days to kind of get back into like writing in kind of marketing speak. So it's this weird kind of duality in my brain of being very, very formal and uh, sort of strategic versus being very hands-on and very creative. And I know that at the very start of this conversation, you were talking about back in your old role, you started to feel like things were getting a little bit stagnant and you weren't growing as much. Can you just describe what it's like now to be doing work that you're really enjoying and really engaged with? What's that like for you on a day-to-day basis? I never, ever watched the clock. And I didn't do that that much in my old job, but I was very aware, oh, it's Wednesday, it's two days to the weekend. And I felt quite often quite stressed at my old job. I'm perfectly happy to be kind of, you know, have lots on and, you know, not have much time. That's fine. But I think when you're stressed and you really don't, care about the outcome in a way. I mean, you know, I'd be working on things that I really, you know, I'd written the presentation sort of a hundred times over, but in slightly different ways for different clients. But yet I have a deadline and yet, you know, there's various sort of stresses kind of to add to that. When you don't really care, I think that sort of starts to really get to you. So I think, I think the fact that my days go so quickly, the fact that I'm learning so much, I mean, every day, I mean, there's all this vocabulary that people use in TV that I had never, you know, I'd never heard before. So every day I'm just learning something new, doing something new, meeting new people. And I really feel like I am constantly, constantly growing. I mean, I'm feeling challenged a lot of the time. I mean, quite often I'll get asked to do something and I have absolutely no idea how I'm going to achieve it. But I'm never, my brain is never kind of asleep. It's exhausting, but it's really great. I feel like I'm in flow (laughs) to use one of those sort of business terms. Very cool. The other thing I was wondering about is whether or not this new life that you have for yourself, this new professional life, has that had any sort of impact on the rest of your life at all? And if so, what impact has it had? A couple of my friends simultaneously to me, there's about four of us who all kind of sat down about a year ago and said, we like our jobs, but we're not that happy. Let's make a change. So actually, we've all changed jobs. So amongst them, it's really great because we can kind of compare notes and say, you know, oh, this is really hard. This is great, etc. But I think amongst my friends who have are still doing the same thing in a sort of friendly way, there's a bit of, there's, I guess there's a bit of jealousy in a kind of, oh, you're so brave. You know, I can't believe you're doing this. I wish I could, I wish I could be brave enough to do it. That sort of thing. But yeah, I think, I think generally the reaction amongst my sort of friendship groups and, and um, my family has been very, very positive. And the final question I've got for you before we start talking a little bit more about your current project is what's the best career advice that you've ever received? This is something I was sort of doing unconsciously and then someone said it to me and I was like, ah, oh, this is the best thing, which is basically saying yes to everything. So I've heard it being called an opportunity mindset before. Basically, once I handed in my notice, Every single opportunity, every single meeting, every single bit of work experience I said yes to. And I found myself in some very weird places, being invited to some very weird lectures and parties and to meet some very random people. But actually, every single thing has led to something. So I think the more open you are to opportunities, the more likely things will happen to you. And I think when you've been stuck in the same role or the same industry for a long time, you tend to sort of be very comfortable. So you say no to lots of things. And actually, I think the best things happen career-wise and sort of life-wise when you say yes. Just to wrap up today, so let's go back to talking a little bit about fake hamsters and ashes and things like that. (laughs) So can you just tell us a little bit more about your current set design projects? I understand you're working on a sitcom right now. So I'm working on episodes, the American sitcom, which is mainly filmed in the UK. That comes to screens, I believe, either the end of this year or the beginning of next. And that's been a really, really exciting project. I really feel like I've landed on my feet, that being my first proper set design job because it's a very big team and there's a big art department team which is what I'm part of which is great because there's lots and lots of people to learn from and lots for me to do which has been really really great 
I'm a double role again, very hybrid person, always. Oh. Um, I'm the art department assistant and I am a buyer. So basically the art department assistant part means that I am available to do anything. So sometimes I do a bit of food styling. <laughs> oh, right. That is not easy. Yeah, it's weird. I, I thought I was terrible at it, but I've been asked again and again to do it. I mean, the irony is I'm a terrible cook, but apparently I can make food look good. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> also important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, and, and making props and then also being available on set to kind of run on and, and do things and kind of make sure the continuity is always preserved. And then the buyer side of my role is what I was talking about earlier, where I'm sort of brief to run off and buy a prop. And then sort of assisting, there's a senior buyer who's been in the business for years and sort of assisting him to buy the big pieces, like huge bits of furniture and carpets and lamps and things like that. So it's been a very varied role. And is there something that you've learned about set design that you never fully appreciated or just never really noticed as a passive viewer before you got into this industry? I think it's probably the amount of care and attention that is given to the details. If there's a scene that takes place in an office and there's a notice board with lots of notices on it, the casual viewer would just, they probably wouldn't even notice that. But the secret is that every single notice on that notice board has actually got copy on it and that copy is relevant. So someone will have sat in an office and thought about, you know, what will be on an office notice board? There's probably some takeaway menus. There's So I think the level of detail and even down to... For example, when I'm doing food styling, if I have to prepare a salad, I have to research what kind of fruit and vegetable you can get in that particular part of the US. I can't put something in that they wouldn't eat or the actor would never eat because he loves meat. Why would he ever have a vegetable salad? That kind of thing. I think it's the level of thinking that goes into every single detail and details that 99% of people will never notice. But if they were missing, they would. <laughs> Very interesting. Gosh, I could talk about this all day, but uh, I'm going to let you go here. So if, if someone's looking for help with set design, either for TV or film or photo shoots or interior design, how can they find you and contact you? So if you go to my website, which is polyaspinall.com, that's the best place to find out more about me. And on top of that, my LinkedIn profile is also very detailed. Well, thank you so much, Polly, for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us and share your thoughts on the power of networking and how you went about creating your new life, this idea of the opportunity mindset, and also just a glimpse into the fascinating world of set design. So I'm going to keep an eye on uh, those fuzzy hamsters next time. So thank you so much for your time and congratulations on the new role. Brilliant. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. So I hope you enjoy hearing Polly's thoughts on the impact of meeting new people, being open to opportunities, and being okay with starting over. Now it's time to wrap up with today's Mental Fuel, where I'll be sharing my own thoughts on saying yes to imperfect opportunities. This is the part of the show called Mental Fuel, where I'll finish the show with a brief personal story related to one of the topics we covered today and wrap up with a simple challenge that'll hopefully benefit you during your own career transitions. So for today's Mental Fuel, I'm going to leave you with a few closing thoughts on something Polly touched on, which is being open to opportunities. And I want to talk specifically about saying yes to opportunities that aren't 100% perfect. So I would say that I'm a fairly picky person, pretty much with everything. I think most people who know me well would probably agree with that statement, whether it's something completely trivial, like where to eat when I'm traveling or picking out a pair of running shoes or something more significant, like where to live or the people I choose to spend time with in my life. I'm probably more selective than the average person. So you can imagine that when it comes to my career, which is a big part of my life, I have this tendency to be even pickier which I would say doesn't always serve me well. I remember when I was working at a consumer goods company and I made it clear to my managers and my directors that there were certain brands within the company that I just wouldn't want to market. Anyway, I'm fairly certain that this made it a little bit harder for the higher ups in the organization to find appropriate roles for me as I was working toward getting promoted. And it, it probably had a negative impact on my internal marketability within the company. So more recently, after I left the corporate world to start my own career consultancy, I tried to take a really different approach, one that was much more in line with what Polly had suggested, which is to basically say yes to every opportunity that came my way. 
So as I was building up my business, I was pretty open to doing a lot of different things. And if something was even remotely related to career coaching, I did it. And these opportunities weren't 100% on target with the work I wanted to be doing, but they definitely helped me discover how I did want to be spending my time. Now, jump forward to the present day, and I'm a lot more focused right now. At the time of this recording, most of the workshops I now do are either related to only marketing your personal brand or career change. And the limited amount of individual coaching I do at this moment is strictly focused on personal branding for career changers and business owners. But that phase when I was saying yes to everything, even those imperfect opportunities definitely helped me gain this eventual focus. It not only helped me organically establish, build, and expand my business, but it helped me meet a lot of different types of people and clients, and it helped me figure out what I enjoyed doing and what I didn't enjoy doing. Anyway, I'm sharing this story with you because while I think there is a lot of power in being selective and focused, at the same time, I do think that there are times in our lives, especially when we're navigating a transition or making a pivot, when being more indiscriminately open can actually serve you really well. When taking a job that isn't 100% right or meeting that contact that's not 100% in your target industry can still be useful and informative. So instead of waiting for the perfect opportunity, maybe just start browsing like you would if you were casually window shopping or browsing through a bookstore. You don't have to buy anything, but you might just stumble upon something you didn't even know you wanted. This makes me think of a quote from Isaac Asimov. Your assumptions are your windows on the world. Scrub them off every once in a while or the light won't come in. So my challenge to you is to pursue that career opportunity or side project that doesn't feel 100% perfect, but could still be interesting to explore. What's one idea you've been saying no to because of what it does not offer that you could instead say yes to because of what it does offer? If you want some help clarifying exactly what you stand to gain by saying yes to a new opportunity, you can download a free worksheet I created to help you organize your thoughts at careerrelaunch.net slash episode four, where you can also find a summary of the key ideas and links mentioned today. While you're there, I'd love for you to subscribe to the show, ask me a question, or leave me a comment about what you've decided to now say yes to. You'll find the links to do that right there at careerrelaunch.net slash episode four. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Career Relaunch, and a special thanks again to Polly Aspinall for speaking with us. This episode was mixed by Raid Sandtrack. Electrocardiogram wrote and performed our original theme song. I'm Joseph Liu, and I'll see you next time. Hold up. 